So a very warm welcome to the last seminars of this term. Um, it's a huge pleasure to have Ander Holroyd, who's going to be speaking about matching random points. As usual, um, if you have any questions, please um, ask them in the chat, um, and Alex and I will uh, decide whether to interrupt Ander or to take them at the end. Great, over to you, Ander. Thanks very much. Okay, well, thank you. Um, lovely to be here. Um, sorry, it's not in person, but uh, um, on the other hand, wonderful to see so many people who uh, probably wouldn't be here if it was in person. Um, so, uh, right, what's this all about? Um, so let's talk about politics. Um, I know that's a little risky. Um, um, so in particular, how, how, how do you share resources between individuals? Uh, um, and what does it mean to do that fairly? Well, okay, you, um, you might say the fairest thing is to just whatever resource you have, just divide it equally between everyone. So that you can't get fairer than that. But somehow that's, uh, that's not realistic in real life because the world is uneven, right? Uh, so individuals have different locations, um, different resources that they have already, different abilities, desires, um, etc. So, um, so it's more complicated than that. Um, but um, nevertheless, you might um, decide you somehow want to maximize overall happiness, whatever that means. Um, so you know, the sort of question you could consider is, is um, you know, should, should you, is it a good idea to make some change that makes one individual X happier, but some other individual Y less happy? Um, well, you probably say it's going to depend, um, might depend how much happier and how much less happy. So maybe if you're making X much happier, but only inconveniencing Y a little bit as a result, then maybe that uh, sounds like a good change to make. Um, but then maybe it also depends how well off or, or how happy they were to begin with. So if X was already doing much better than Y, um, maybe there's less of an argument for um, making X even happier at Y's expense. Okay, so, um, you know, of course, there's nothing new here. People have been um, pondering questions like this for millennia. What, um, how, what's the correct thing to optimize? Um, what is fairness? Um, and again, nothing really new here, but, but one thing you might try to do to make sense of all these questions is try to maximize the sum over individuals of some increasing function of happiness, whatever that means. And sort of different choices of function will, will correspond to different notions of, of um, you know, how we weigh different individuals' needs. Um, so, um, so, of course, mathematics and science uh, should have nothing to say on, on um, what is the best thing to maximize. That, that's, um, that's not a scientific question. But um, on the other hand, we might be able to say, given um, a criterion given, say, a function f. What are the consequences of trying to maximize that? What does the, what do the solutions look like? Are there solutions? Uh, is it possible for individuals to agree on a solution, um, etc.? So that's what I'm going to try to focus on. Um, so yeah, I mean, individuals, of course, could be people, but they could also be companies or computers. These are very uh, general questions. And because I want to do mathematics, what I would really like is a very simple, clean mathematical model that encapsulates these kind of ideas and, and is simple enough that I can say something about it, but I'm still rich enough to um, want to capture some of the interesting phenomena. Um, so here is such a model, um, matching 
So the setting is um, I have a bunch of red points and a bunch of blue points and they're points in space and I want to match them. Right, so I'm given the points um, and I want to form the matching of each red point to a blue point. And the idea is I want to make the edges as short as possible. That's, that's the thing that we're trying to optimize. Um, so of course you could imagine matching buyers to sellers or mating, um, uh, uh, lots of, um, lots of applications you could have in mind. Um, so, um, yeah, so well, we, we, we want to match points as close as possible. So um, you might say we try, we are given the points and we try to choose a matching that minimizes um, the sum of, well, some function of the distances between points and let's take that function to be just a power. So we fix a, a number gamma and we try to minimize the sum of the edge lengths to the power gamma. Um, okay, so um, actually people have worked on this sort of question a lot, um, but what I want to do, which is a little bit unusual, uh, is I want to think about the points themselves um, as being random and being um, moreover infinite sets of points. So I want to take the red points and the blue points to be independent Poisson processes on RD, Poisson processes of, of intensity one. So presumably everyone knows what that means, but just in case you don't, a Poisson process of intensity one means that the number of points in a fixed set of fixed set A is has a Poisson distribution with mean the volume of A and disjoint sets contain in, uh, independent numbers of points. So it's a random countable set of points, one per unit volume. And I take the red points and the blue points to be independent Poisson processes. Um, okay, so why, okay, if I'm interested in politics or whatever, why would I take infinite point sets? Well, um, it's because uh, I want to focus on very, very large ensembles of individuals. But so you could think about taking a limit as the number of points goes to infinity, but uh, I want to not, not nevertheless keep my focus local. So I am an individual and I'm trying to um, uh, find a partner in this matching or solve whatever optimization problem we're trying to solve. Uh, and I want to consider the limit when I focus on a local window, but let the universe go to infinity. And a, a very clean and simple way to approach that mathematically is to just take an infinite universe to begin with, right? Um, so that's what I want to do. Um, so of course, there's a problem. I have infinitely many points. This sum that I'm trying to minimize is going to be infinite. Um, so I can't minimize it. So it doesn't make sense. Um, so here's the solution. Here's the thing I want to focus on. I have my sets of points, R and B, red and blue points. I have my gamma, and I want to say that a matching is gamma minimal if for every finite set of edges in the matching, I have the minimum cost matching of those, of the endpoints of those edges. Okay, so again, this, this is the key definition. So it's good to understand it. I'm given a matching and I say it's minimal if for every finite set of edges, you cannot rematch their endpoints to reduce the cost, where the cost is this sum of the gamma powers of the edge lengths. Um, so yeah, the definition of the sum of the gamma powers is the minimum over all the other ways you could match those uh, 
the, those finite collections of points, which is to say that you choose a permutation and you, instead of matching Ri to Bi, you match Ri to B sigma of I. Okay. That's the definition. Um, and yeah, by the way, I should have, maybe I should have said even in this previous um, picture, what does this gamma, let, let, let's go here. What, what does this gamma parameter represent? This, this parameter that I can choose. You can think of it as a measure of fairness because if gamma is big, it means I really penalize long edges a lot. If gamma is 10, I, 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 the thing I'm trying to minimize is the sum of the 10th power of the edges. So when I have a long edge, that's bad for those two points. The, the, the points are the individuals. Um, and I really penalize that. So, so I would much rather change the matching around so that I don't have really long edges. So if, if gamma is large, then we really try to avoid making things bad for uh, making things very bad for some individuals, even if that may, means making things slightly less inconvenient for a bunch of others. Um, and if Gamma is small. Well, we we don't care about that so much. We don't penalize very long edges. We, we focus on trying to just make the short edges smaller. Um, and okay, so that was for gamma positive, but we can actually consider gamma negative as well. So I could take gamma negative, and I could say we um, um, so so. Okay, if gamma is positive, then the gamma power is increasing. And if gamma is negative, it's decreasing. So for gamma negative, it makes sense to maximize the sum of the gamma powers. In other words, replace length to the gamma with minus length to the gamma. So I'll consider that as well. So taking gamma negative is um, even more in the direction of uh, selfishness, if you like, uh, greedy matching. So. Uh, if gamma is really negative, that means, so now it's a reward that I'm trying to maximize, a reward for short edges, and I really, really reward short edges. So if, if a red and blue point are close to each other and they can match with a very short edge, then that's the highest priority, we do that. Um, and um, you can also take gamma equals zero, and the, the thing that makes sense there is to, instead of, Taking the gamma power, take the log of the distance. And the reason I call that gamma equals zero is you can interpret it as a limit as gamma tends to zero. If, if you, so that, that's just a limit for finite sets of points. If you take a finite set of points and you take gamma to zero, then in the limit, it's the same as minimizing the log, sum of the logs. Um, and Power laws and logs are really the only scale invariant choices here. So I could choose to minimize any function, but power laws and logs have the property that if I just scale the collections of points, um, double, uh, scale them by two, then the, um, the minimal matchings will be the same. And a quick question on behalf yeah. of Joel. Yeah. yeah. Um, couldn't we have a gamma minimal matching where every edge was, say, around a thousand? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Maybe I'll let, um, uh, let me just try and find Joel. I can probably ask him to unmute. Yes, I mean, suppose, I mean, imagine every edge was exactly a thousand, then uh -huh. that would be gamma minimal even though you could have much, much better. Uh, clearly it's not good, but, but might it still match your gamma minimal definition? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, I mean, basically I would say no. I mean, if, I mean, it depends what gamma is and so on, but, but if locally you could do better, if there were two edges, for instance, where you could swap their partners and, and, and get a shorter length, then, then wouldn't be. Oh, I, I think I see. Okay. I retract. But, but yeah, but, but I mean, it's a good thing to bring up because this is, so for a finite set of points, then, you know, my definition is, is the obvious 
natural one. You just minimize the thing you're trying to minimize. That, um, um, but for an infinite set of points, yeah, it's not so obvious. Maybe you have a, a matching which is you know, can't be improved locally, and yet still you think maybe you ought to be able to do better. So that's that's part of the point. Right? Um, um, so yeah. So so my definition is you you have the minimum matching locally. There's no local improvement that you can make to cost. Local means you take a finite number of edges and you rewire them and, and you do that. Right. Okay, so I can take gamma to be any real number. And I can also take um, gamma equals minus infinity and gamma equals plus infinity. These also make sense as limits, and once again, it's just a limit for a finite set of points. Um, and so gamma equals minus infinity is kind of the most selfish extreme. Of, and that uh, is equivalent to you lexicographically minimize the increasing ordering of the edge lengths. And again, this just applies to the finite definition. Right? For every finite set of edges, it minimizes this uh, lexicographic ordering. So, so it means for every finite set of points, the, the highest priority is to make the shortest edge as short as possible. And then once you've done that, you can make the second shortest as short as possible, and so on. And at the other end of the extreme, I have something which I call the altru altruistic matching, which is also very interesting. You lexicographically minimize the decreasing ordering of the edge lengths. So at least in, for a finite set of points, your first priority is to make the longest edge as short as possible. And then after you've done that, you make the second longest edge as short as possible. So it's, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you think of it as individuals trying to do this, it, it's as altruistic as you can reasonably be. I, I, I'm willing to make myself less happy if it, as long as it makes someone else happier, right up to the point where they get as happy as me. If it would make them actually happier than me, then I'm not willing to do it, but, but anything short of that, uh, I'm willing to do. Okay, so we have this spectrum of gammas. Um, so here are some pictures. Um, so of course, these are pictures with finitely many points. There are finitely many random points on a box. So here is however many random points on a square, and here is the minimal matching with gamma equals one. So that's just the one where you minimize the total length of all the edges. And here is gamma equals minus infinity. So this is the selfish end of the spectrum, right? So um, so you see it's very different. That was gamma equals one. That was gamma equals minus infinity. So you have, I mean, you sort of have the, it, by the way, it's the same set of points. So, you know, you, th there are difficulties that arise. Like here in the top left, just because of random fluctuations, you have an excess of blue points, it looks like. Or, or maybe here is a bit clear. You have an excess of blue points. So you have to deal with them somehow. With gamma equals one, you have all these edges stacked up. With gamma equals infinity, it, it's much more chaotic in a way because the nearby points just, just match anyway. And then you're left with some points that have to go a really, really long way um, to find a partner. Um, and here is the other end of the spectrum, gamma equals plus infinity. This is the altruistic matching. So again, there a different character. So again, that's plus infinity, minus infinity, one, minus infinity, and plus infinity. Um, so um, it turns out um, of these three pictures I just showed you, there is only one of them which um, is known to extend to the infinite plane. Only one of those three. You might like to guess which one it is. For the other two, it's not known whether there's a version on the infinite plane. Um, so what are the questions we might ask? Um, we fix a gamma, we fix a setting and so on. Um, so does a gamma minimal matching even exist? Right, so you 
if you think again about the application, you, you, your society has decided on a gamma, you have this utopian system of government or economic system where you, you've decided on the perfect gamma. Well, is there even a solution? Um, if not, it's not so good. Um, is it unique? So this could be a problem, right? If, and again, you know, really the world is finite, but I'm imagining you're looking at your local window, which is part of a huge universe. So, so is the uh, minimal matching unique? If not, well, if there are two of them, uh, I can argue that this, here's an optimal solution, which happens to favor me more than it favors you. And you can argue for a different optimal solution so that you have a potential source of conflict there. Conflict. Um, but you could also ask, is every point matched? Is it a perfect matching? Well, hold on a minute. What does that mean? Uh, uh, you thought I was talking about perfect matchings the whole time, right? Um, so I was, but I can actually allow unmatched points. And it makes sense to do that. Um, maybe it also makes sense not to, but um, uh, you can. So I, I allow a, a matching with unmatched points. And then I need to extend my definition of gamma minimal. And what it is now going to mean is this. Gamma minimal means for every finite collection of edges of the matching and also every finite collection of unmatched points. You cannot do better for these endpoints, the, the endpoints of the edges and the unmatched points. And what does it mean that you cannot do better? It means your first priority is to minimize the number of unmatched points in this little finite world that you've decided to focus on. So first priority, you have to minimize the number of unmatched points because I'm thinking unmatched points are infinitely bad, right? It makes sense because the, 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 the cost function is increasing. So if you're not matched at all, that's like you're matched to infinity, that's infinitely bad. So first priority, minimize the unmatched points and then subject to that, minimize the usual sum. Uh, and I said this for gamma positive, but similarly for the, you can make sense of this for the other settings as well. Um, so in particular, I mean, it, it's, it's obvious what this first part means actually. It, it, so uh, it just means for the finite collection of points that you're looking at, the, the number of unmatched points has to be just the excess of one color over another. If I, if I show you a collection of five red points and three blue points, then you must have two unmatched red points. So, so you have to minimize the cost over all matchings that have exactly two unmatched red points. And you have to do that for every finite set of edges and finite set of unmatched points. Um, and some more questions you could ask. Uh, if there is a minimal matching, can we decide on it locally? You know, again, uh, if, imagine some um, political system, if you like, um, you, you've decided what uh, the, the optimal matching that you're aiming for. Well, is there a way for the agents to locally agree on it uh, in, in a way that uh, makes sense globally. Um, and then you can just also ask how good it is. I mean, we're trying to minimize edge lengths. Well, how good are the edge lengths that we end up with? Um, what's the average edge length and so forth? Um, right, and so also, so I talked about two colors matching red to blue points, but you could do all this with one color matching as well. You just have a single um, point process of red points and you want to pair them up. And all the definitions go through basically. So uh, what do we know? Um, many, many things we don't know and a few things we do. Um, so gamma equals minus infinity, which is the uh, selfish end of the spectrum. Um, we have a fairly complete picture. Um, 
dimension one and arbitrary, yeah, I, maybe, I, maybe I didn't say, I'm, I'm, I'm working always on RD, I did, I did say, I'm working on Euclidean space in D dimension, so you can vary the gamma and you can vary the dimension, you can consider one color or two color. Um, so dimension one, especially two color, it turns out we have a fairly complete picture. And the, if you want the high level conclusion of what we know so far, it's maybe not so, so surprising. It's that fairness makes things harder. Um, the larger gamma is, the less well behaved the, the set of minimal matchings is. So it's not, maybe not so surprising. If you, if you insist on fairness, it makes it much harder to agree. Um, and yeah, d greater than or equal to two, we know um, very, very little, but we do know at least existence of minimal matchings in some cases. Um, and um, yeah, but not all cases. So for example, uh, here's the answer to my little riddle from earlier. In two dimensions, we do not know even existence of a minimal matching for gamma equals one or for gamma equals infinity. Um, right, so, um, by the way, Christina, should I, should I go to 10-2 or, or, or what? Feel free to go to 5-2 if you want to. Okay, good. Um, right, so let me talk a little bit about gamma equals minus infinity then, which as I say, gamma equals minus infinity we know a lot about. Um, so this, uh, I've been working on for a while, um, and particularly this, this paper by myself, P. Mantle, Perez, and Tram from 2008, uh, where we deal with this problem. So the first thing is, um, for all dimensions, uh, one or two color, um, there is a minus infinity minimal matching, and it's unique. And it's perfect, so there are no, no much points. Um, and in fact, it's um, equivalent to something else in disguise. Um, it is the unique stable matching in, um, in the sense of Gale and Shapley. So there's this extremely famous paper of Gale and Shapley in 1962, um, where they define stable matching or stable marriage and in our context, it means this. Um, once again, you imagine the points as agents and people, if you like, and each point wants a partner and it prefers that partner to be as close as possible. And we say that the matching is unstable if there exists a pair of points of opposite colors, which would both prefer to be each other, would prefer to be matched to each other over what they have currently. What they have is either their current partner or maybe one of them is unmatched even, which would be even worse. Um, right, so if, there, um, if there's a pair like that, a pair of points that would both prefer to be matched to each other compared with what they have, then you call the matching unstable. And matching is stable if there are no unstable pairs. And this, this minus infinity minimal matching is precisely the unique stable matching. Um, yeah, so I would say if you take one thing away from this talk, um, go and read this paper by Gale and Shapley. It's, it's an absolute classic, it's lovely, it's got thousands of citations, it, it's known in economics and computer science very widely. Um, it, it, it's it's, know, it's only 10 pages or something, very, very friendly and accessible, easy to read. Um, so the, their original formulation of this problem is you have um, N girls and N boys, and they're going to be, they want to get paired up into N heterosexual couples. Um, uh, and they have arbitrary preference orders over the other. So each girl has a preference order over the N boys, which could be any ordering, different one for each individual. Um, and their 
presentable theorem is there exists a stable matching, a stable set of n heterosexual marriages. And moreover, there's a very nice algorithm for generating it. Um, and yeah, in this setting, um, the matching is not unique. Um, and moreover, if you change the problem a little bit, if you've considered the one color matching or the same sex marriage problem, um, what, they, what they had to call the roommates problem in 1962, um, uh, then there may not be a stable matching. Um, and yeah, so the, uh, as a result of this work and the, and the work that followed on from it, the 2012 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics was awarded to Roth and Chaplin, Chaplin being one of the authors of this. So very beautiful and important piece of mathematics. Um, so in right, so in our setting, so how is our setting different? We have an infinite set of points, random infinite set. Um, but on the other hand, the preference order is very special. The preference order is distance. And it turns out many things are easy in this case because there is a simple algorithm to construct the stable matching. And the algorithm is the following. You have your red and blue points. You match all mutually closest red-blue pairs. So you look in the whole of RD and you find a red and a blue point that are mutually closest. So this is the closest red point to this and this is the closest blue point to this. Um, for every such pair, you just match them simultaneously everywhere. And then you remove them from consideration and you repeat on the points you have left. Right, so it makes sense, right? Gamma equals minus infinity. We're, we're trying to match, we're trying to get short edges. That's our priority. So if you see a pair that are mutually closest, they have to match. You just can't do better. Uh, so, so that's what we do. We iteratively match mutually closest pairs. And it turns out this. Um, so you just repeat for countably many steps. This matches everything and it gives you the unique stable matching unit minus infinity minimal matching. Um, and yeah, so there's uh, a lot that we know about this thing. I, I'm not going to talk primarily about this matching, but there's a lot that we know about it. Um, for instance, you can look at the matching distance, which is the distance from a typical point to its partner. Um, that's a random variable, and we know that it has power law tails. Um, uh, there's uh, an alpha and a beta, and, and we know that the beta of the moment is infinite, but all moments below the alpha is finite. And depending on the setting, either we have matching bounds for alpha and beta, or we don't, but we have bounds anyway. Here's what some of them look like. Um, in specific cases, you can do much better. Um, for instance, in the simplest case of one color stable matching on the line, we now know that the tail of the matching distance decays like, so that should be an R, not an X, it's constant over R. Um, and we know what the constant is. It's um, something explicit involving Euler's constant. Um, this is work in progress with Tom Eccles and Tom Liggett. Um, I should mention, uh, so Tom Liggett, uh, my co-author on the thing I just mentioned, tragically died earlier this year. Um, uh, very shocking and tragic. Um, uh, and we were, yeah, we were working together on this earlier in the year. So he was certainly very, very active. Um, so um, yeah, so as I said, I'm not going to focus on stable matching for this talk. I'm going to focus on other gamma. I'll just point out there are many variants of stable matching, many of which I've worked on. Um, there are variants uh, where there are variants involving more than two colors of points. There are um, variants where points have degree more than one. You'd consider a, a graph, a stable graph where the points have general degrees and uh, stable allocations, which is the 
little picture. So there are lots of things you can do, um, lots of open questions, but also lots of things we know how to do. Um, so instead, for the rest of this talk, though, I'm going to talk about uh, general gamma, gamma minimal matchings. I'm going to talk especially about the case that we now understand reasonably well, which is one dimension. So this is one of these problems where even in one dimension, you know, there's quite a rich and subtle um, range of behavior. So here are some pictures on a finite interval in one dimension. So I have seven different values of gamma from plus three down to minus three, and I have the same set of red and blue points in each case, and the points are drawn as vertical lines, right? So when you see a red vertical line, it means there's a red point there, and it's just the same configuration for each horizontal line. That's why I do it that way. And then the edges of the matching are shown in black, and I, um, I draw them as arcs going one way if the red point is on the left, going up if the red point is on the left of the two points and down if the red point is on the right. Um, so you see um, interesting things happen. So um, gamma equals one is somehow very different from the others, but above one, two and three look very, very similar to each other. And below one, all these four at the bottom look very, very similar to each other, although not quite identical. And of course the ones at the top have very different character to the ones at the bottom. And remember, large gamma means we really penalize long edges. So not surprisingly, we have a lot fewer long edges at the top. Um, right, so uh, most, of what, most of what I will talk about for the rest is joint work with Svante Janssen and Johan Westland. Um, Paper is not out yet, but very nearly finished. Um, so in one dimension, uh, for any gamma, the first thing is the matching is perfect. So more precisely, almost surely with respect to the points, every minimal matching is perfect. There are no minimal matchings with unmatched points. Okay, so I want to pause for a minute and understand exactly what this means. Um, because there's another statement you could make, which is much easier to prove. Uh, the, the theorem is a stronger statement. So here's, a, here's another statement, which is also true, uh, but this is true for any dimension any stationary gamma minimal matching is perfect. So what do I mean by that? Fix gamma, the points are random, the red and blue points are random. Suppose you have a way of choosing a matching for every realization of the point process. You have some way, perhaps using extra randomness of, of choosing a, ma a minimal matching. Uh, I want to say as a function of the points, but you can use extra randomness as well if you want to. Um, so, so that will give you a random minimal matching and I call it stationary if the whole picture you get, the points together with the matching is stationary, invariant under translations. Okay, so, and, and this is, at least for me, this is m more the sort of setting that we're used to reasoning about. You have that this whole random process that's invariant in law, the point plus the matching. So any anything like that, a stationary minimal matching is perfect. And that's true in all dimensions. And this really follows from, from um, very standard arguments. So um, in, let's say for two colors, for instance, um, if, if you have a stationary minimal matching, all unmatched points have to be of the same color. You cannot have an unmatched red point and an unmatched blue point at the same time because then the matching wouldn't be minimal. You would do better by just matching them to each other. So, um, so that's a fact. And then just 
sort of general stuff about um, ergodicity tells you um, you cannot have any unmatched points. It, it, it can't be true that with positive probability you have unmatched red points and no unmatched blue points. So very generic arguments tell you this. So the top statement is, is saying something stronger. It's really saying stronger and it's weaker because it's only in one dimension, but the statement is almost surely with respect to the points, you look at the whole set of minimal matchings. Maybe there are none, maybe there's one, maybe there are uncountably many. Um, none of them have unmatched points. So it's really a stronger statement. Um, and um, also it's, uh, we can prove this on the strip, R cross an interval. And in particular, we don't know how to prove this in higher dimensions. So, so we don't know whether this theorem is true for D equals two. So we know it for D equals one. Um, so, um, yeah, so for D equals one, uh, actually gamma equals one is very, very special in one dimension. Because if you have four points like this, two red and two blue, uh, with the two red points on the left and the two blue points on the right, then there are two possible matchings, this, this one and this one. Um, and for gamma equals one, they have the same cost. Gamma equals one means we're trying to minimize the total length and well, they have the same total length. Um, so for gamma equals one, there are lots and lots of ties. There are lots of cases where you're just indifferent which matching you choose. And we can actually, to understand what's going on a bit better, we can introduce gamma equals one plus and gamma equals one minus, which again can be interpreted as limits as gamma tends to one from above and below. And um, it turns out if you think about what these limits mean, that means that you always break these ties in the manner of the top guy or the bottom guy. Um, so with that in mind, here's a theorem. So this is dimension one, two colors. Almost surely the set of minimal matchings is as follows. Um, there's kind of a phase transition at gamma equals one. Um, so for gamma bigger than one and even one plus as well, there are minimal matchings. In fact, there's precisely a countable family of them and k for k and integer, and there is no stationary matching. So, right, so it's not so good for your social order if that's the case, because, um, okay, there are solutions, but you can't really choose between them. There are, there are infinitely many solutions, and there's no um, stationary solution. So, so there's no solution that treats all locations equally, if you like. Um, so that's... Uh, not so good. Uh, on the other hand, and on the bottom line for, um, I call this subcritical for gamma less than one and not including one minus, uh, everything is good in this sense. There is a unique uh, minimal matching for each such gamma and uh, therefore it's stationary um, because, uh, right, so you have the points for, each, for almost every realization of the points, there's just exactly one matching. So you can choose that matching. It's a function of the points and there you have a stationary matching right there. Um, and in between, so gamma equals one, um, there are uncountably many minimal matchings, not, maybe not so surprising because we have all these ties, definitely not surprising in fact, um, and even uncountably many stationary matchings. And then gamma equals one minus is interesting there are sort of two plus infinity matchings. There's a countable family, MK, which is not the same as this countable family up here, and two others, M infinity and M minus infinity, I call them. And the only stationary matchings are these last two and mixtures of them. You can take M plus infinity with probability a third and add one with probability two thirds. Um, and another question you could ask is, call a matching locally finite if 
the to take the origin of, of any location and ask how many edges cross over it. If that's finite, almost surely for every point, I call them actually locally finite. If it's infinite, uh, I call it locally infinite. So um, yeah, so in this um, subcritical regime at the bottom, the unique matching is locally infinite. And up here, each of these are locally finite. So, you know, it's kind of, we do better in a way because we're, we're really making the edges short and, and going along with that, there are only finitely many edges crossing over a place. But the downside is you, there's no way to do it in a stationary way. Whereas if you allow, yeah, in, the, in this case, there is. Um, and yeah, in between, like the, these ones are locally finite, these ones are locally infinite. Um, here's another theorem. Um, going back to the picture that I had in one dimension, um, actually for gamma greater than or equal to one plus, the matchings are all the same. So for each gamma, there is a set of matchings and it's just the same set for each gamma. Gamma equals two, gamma equals three. It's just the, the set of matchings is literally the same. Um, on the other hand, right, so then you sort of have the phase transition point at gamma equals one. And remember below gamma equals one, they all looked very similar to each other as well. So here's a statement that we can make. If you take two different gammas and compare the two matchings, then they have finite differences. What does that mean? It means you uh, look at the two matchings and superimpose them on each other. Then you get a graph of uh, maximum degree two. The components of that graph are all finite. Almost surely. Um, and yeah, we can, um, we can also talk about tail behavior. So um, in this subcritical case of gamma less than one, um, uh, you can talk about the matching distance, which is the length of a typical edge or the distance from a typical point to its, to its partner. Um, so this has, well, roughly power law decay with power a half. So one way to say it is that the alpha moment is finite if and only if alpha is less than a half with all these gammas. Um, and moreover, the, this nice unique matching can be determined locally. So it can be expressed as a finite factor of the points, which means if you're a point and you want to know who your partner should be under this matching, you can determine it by looking up to some random distance at the other points, um, but it's a, it's a finite random variable. It's like a stopping time. You look up to some random distance and then you know what you should do. And that random distance is called the coding radius. It's finite and it has some finite moment. Um, yeah, so one color, we have one color in one dimension. We have similar results, but we can't quite prove anything, everything. Um, I won't overload you with the information there though. Um, and we can say some things about higher dimensions. Principally, what we can say is in some cases, but not all cases, we know at least that there exists a gamma minimal matching. And in fact, a stationary and hence perfect one. Um, everything else for high dimensions, we know almost nothing. Uniqueness, perfectness, open. Um, we'll come back to that and we'll come back to this as well. Um, right, so let me talk tiny bit about proofs in the last few minutes. Um, so um, in one dimension, okay, here's something that makes things much, much easier. If you have four points on a line, there are, only, there are three perfect matchings of them, right? These three. And the middle one is always worse than the top one because the edges are longer. If you compare the bottom two, then um, 
the middle one is better when gamma equals one and the bottom one is better when gamma is less than one. It's an easy enough computation. Um, and moreover, um, okay, the, if the points have colors, if there are two red and two blue, then um, one of these three matchings is forbidden, right? Because you can't match the red to the red and the blue to the blue. So as a result of that, we can say a lot just deterministically. Um, so as a result of that, uh, so here's what some of these matchings look like. For the supercritical case, um, um, if you have, uh, right, so, you, so you can't have this, you can't have one edge nested inside another one like this. So if you follow it through, what that means is um, order the red points from left to right um, and order the blue points from left to right. The ordering of the red points has to match the ordering of the blue points they're matched with. You can't have two red points here and here are their blue partners and with them the other way around. The, 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 left, the left of the two red points has to be matched to the right of the two blue points. So as a result of that, um, well, here's one way to say what all the matchings are. Take the, take the red and blue points and consider this random walk. This is a random walk that takes a step up whenever I see a red point and takes a step down whenever I see a blue point. That's just a continuous time simple symmetric walk if I have two Poisson processes. Um, take that random walk, take a, um, a level of it, like this dotted line, and look at the excursions above, excursions of the random walk above and below that line. So here's an excursion here that corresponds to um, a bunch of red points and a bunch of blue points in equal numbers because I, I, I came back to this line. So I have two red points and two blue points. So the matchings, well, the matchings are choose a position for that line and then within each of these excursions, you have equal numbers of red, blue, red and blue points, match the ith red point to the ith blue point within the excursion. So that's what the matchings are. And there's a countable family of them because I can choose where to put this line, um, but there's no way to do this in a stationary way. And that, that requires proof, but hopefully it's rather intuitive, you, you, you have this random walk, that, that, that there's no stationary way to fix a height for it because the random walk is, is null recurrent essentially. Um, so that's the picture for gamma greater than one. Um, so gamma less than one, everything's the other way around. You, you cannot have this, you cannot have two um, edges crossing over each other. Um, so as a result of that, you can show rather easily that again, consider the random walk, you must match on the same level of the random walk. Every, right, so every point corresponds to a step of the random walk, and then there are the points that are the same level. So um, the, uh, this point here is on the same level as this point here, for example. And you must match to your partner must be on the same level because if not, then um, in between you and your partner, there would be an imbalance of red and blue points. And so um, one of them would have to match outside this interval and that would lead to two edges crossed like that. Um, so for instance, um, I'm kind of running out of time, but but um, for instance, with gamma equals one minus, this was this special case where you have, I claim you have two plus infinity matchings. Here's what they are. You again, think about the random walk, put a level at some point, put, put a, uh, pick on a level and put a horizontal line there. Uh, for each of the excursions above and below that line, match like this for, for every point corresponds to a step of the random walk. And if it's an excursion above the line, 
um, go along horizontally from each up step to the next down step that you hit. And that's the point that you match to. Do that for every excursion above and for every excursion below, do it the other way around. Um, so you can do that with the purple line at any integer height, but there are also two other cases. You can take the purple line all the way up to infinity, which means um, you do this matching across always this way, or you can take it down to minus infinity. These are the other two. Um, right, unfortunately, I'm running out of time. Um, yeah, I guess I. Yeah, pro probably I ought to stop that, because you know, I mean, I, I, I um, yeah, if, if if people want to hear the idea of one of these, one of the other proofs, I can tell you. Um, but for now, let's stop. There are lots of open questions. Thanks very much, Ander. What I'm going to suggest is anybody who wants to discuss a bit further, if you're willing, Ander, once we've stopped recording in the break, mm -hmm. maybe take sort of longer questions or, yeah. or look at the proof then. Yeah, but absolutely. Just, yeah. Take a couple of questions now that have sort of come up along the way. So in yeah. particular, um, there's um, one from Jeff Stive. Jeff, feel free to unmute yourself, which I think you can now do. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, hey, I was Jeff. just wondering. Hi, Ander. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, <laughs> The uh, so you have these examples where you have matchings, but there's you don't have stationary matchings. And then I was thinking, you know, why you can't do the usual thing to create something stationary yes. by taking the average and taking a limit. Good. But I'm guessing sort of everything disappears off at infinity or something. Exactly. Yeah. So this was uh, one of the so the um, right. So the the cases where we do know existence, there there are two. I mean, okay, there are sort of special cases where just combinatorially we can analyze everything. And that includes a couple of ones I said, but but apart from that, the, the, the reason we know existence at all in the other cases is because of such limiting arguments, right? You try to match in a box and then take the limit as the box goes to infinity, but you don't rescale. So what can go wrong? What can go wrong is that a point gets matched further and further away. So in the limit, it's matched to infinity. So you have to rule that out. And you know, if you try to do it in this supercritical case that I talked about, then you can't rule it out because that's really what happens. Um, um, in other cases, you can rule it out. And um, yeah, I, well, I don't have time to talk about this, but, but, there, but there are two circumstances under which we can rule it out. And that's how we get the other existence statements. One circumstance is when gamma equals less, when gamma is less than one, there is a property analogous to stability. Basically, you can't have two long edges. You can't have a red and blue point close together, but their edges are long, sticking out to the side, because essentially they would prefer to be matched to each other. And, and that's enough to rule out points get matched to infinity. And then there's another criterion, which is if there exists a matching with finite average cost, which you might be able to prove by some other means. Right? We can. The average cost means edge length to the power gamma for a typical edge. Um, so then you can also take a limit and points don't get matched to infinity and it's somehow because you have a uniform bound so that's enough to get the appropriate compactness. Okay, thank you. So I've got two more questions that have come up. Yeah. So um, maybe Alex first. Uh, yeah, thanks for a nice talk. Um, so uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask, so here you have two Poisson processes that you're matching yes. Um So one thing you could do is replace one of the Poisson processes by something deterministic, and in particular, yes. just uh, just lattice points. Yes, yes. So does, it, does that change things? So in, in the case where you just have a kind of bounded domain and you're matching, people looked at that a lot. Yes. I, I, I wonder what happens here. Does, yes. Does, does, does everything go through the same? It's very good question, I don't know. Um, yeah, it would uh, be a very interesting thing to think about. Um, I mean, my guess is a lot of the a lot of things will go through the same, but um, um, yeah, I, I I haven't thought about it. And yeah, uh, there are many interesting directions one can go, and that's definitely one of them. I mean, you know, I mean, the general thing is you sort of expect the costs to be comparable, right? Because like one way to match two random sets of points is to match 
each of them to the same deterministic lattice. And, uh, and, and there's an argument the other way around as well. So, um, you know, you expect a lot of things to be the same, but um, uh, but I don't know for certain because I haven't Thank decided. <laughs> Great. And then um, another question from Joel Spencer. Joel, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Yes, uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, so D equals one is certainly very special. And I just wonder if, if you see any distinction between D equals two and, and D equals three or any values of D greater than or equal to two, or do you think that they'll basically be similar? I think D equals two is somewhat special. Um, um, let me show you, let me show you this theorem. So as I say, higher dimensions, this is literally all we know, right? We, we just know existence in some cases, um, but, but focus on two colors, these first two lines. Mm -hmm. For two dimensions, we know existence only for gamma less than one. And for three and higher dimensions, we know pretty much for all gamma, except I don't know how to do it for plus infinity, the, the altruistic case, although I didn't think about it maybe as hard as I should have done. Um, so, and, but, but, I, but this might well be the truth. I mean, I wouldn't be at all surprised if in two dimensions, uh, there's no minimal matching for gamma equals one. Uh, or for gamma equals infinity. Actually, wait. Mm. Uh, yeah. Do I want to? Yeah. I, that's right. I mean, both of those are open, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is none. I mean, so so somehow, two dimensions is different, and and especially for two colors. And the reason it's different is, um, because if you just ask. So forget about minimality, just ask how, uh, how efficiently can you match in a stationary way? It turns out you can do much, much better in three dimensions than two dimensions. In three dimensions, you can match with exponential tails for a typical edge. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, in two dimensions, you must have infinite mean for a typical edge. Um, that's, that's for any stationary matching of two color point processes. Okay, thank you. And, and that's where this comes from. This is where this middle line comes from. The fact that there is a matching with mm -hmm. um, with exponential tails. So, so every moment finite. Um, so, so yeah, I think really two dimensions is maybe the most interesting for at least for people who like uh, mysterious and challenging <laughs> quite, I mean, everything's challenging, but <laughs> two dimensions, it's especially challenging. Uh, and, and, and another open, sorry, um, uh, uh, right, here's, a, here's an amazing open question. Two dimensions, two colors, two Poisson processes. Um, is there a stationary matching with no crossings? You just, you, you draw the edges of straight line segments, obviously. Is there a stationary matching with no crossings? So there is a non-stationary one, by the way. Uh, if you had a one minimal one, then it would have no crossings. So that's just by some triangle inequality, isn't it? Uh, but we don't know either. So yeah, we don't we don't know stationary with no crossings. We don't know one minimal stationary or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's rather a roundabout answer, but, but yeah, I, I think two dimensions is going to be far more subtle. Thanks very much, Andrew, for a, a lovely talk and, and lots of fascinating questions. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that in a moment I unmute everybody and we give you a round of applause. Um, and then anybody who kind of wants to hang out and discuss a bit more in the gap between the two seminars is welcome to do so. Let me just say that we have Gwenaëlle Jolet at half past three so that gives you an upper bound on on how much time there is for sort of chatting in the gap and of course anybody who just wants to go and have a coffee that's that's obviously absolutely fine so let me just um press stop <laughs>